welcome to another episode of Beyond Barriers podcast with uh, Jeff Scoop and my co-host Jen Kreiss. And our special guest this uh, episode is Sean Gillespie. Sean, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. If uh, if you could tell us a little bit about your background, I mean, I could I could talk about it a little bit, but if you could uh, share share uh, you know who you are, where you come from, and and uh, a little bit of your story, uh, we we'd love to hear it. Uh, I'm from Spokane, Washington. I grew up here, uh, kind of raised in between here. Summers in uh, Henderson, Nevada, which is right outside of Vegas. Um, my parents split when I was pretty young. I was I want to say about two when they divorced. Um, my mom had some drug addiction issues. My dad, he did for a while, but he got cleaned up and started working for one of the local congressmen here. Um, I had a lot of behavioral issues because I went through some childhood abuse. I was sexually molested and raped by an Asian male. Um, when I was about eight years old, maybe for a two year period, um, a lot of that causes a lot of behavioral issues. So I was in and out of group homes. I would run away. My dad couldn't control me and uh, just was just a, a kind of dis a disturbed youth because I didn't know how to deal with my abuse. I ended up uh, going to state group homes and foster homes here where I started hanging around with like local punks and stuff and running away from the group homes and um, end up going to a, a juvenile detention facility. And while I was there, I heard about Aryan Nations and I seen skinheads and stuff so I was kind of like oh I wonder what these people are like I'm white I like the military uh because they wore camo and I thought I was young I thought I was like oh great it's the military cool and um so I got out and I stole a bicycle and rode it from Spokane Washington to the Hayden Lake compound which is about 45 miles on a BMX and uh was immediately taken in by uh Mike Teague and Sean Winkler and their families and uh I spent about three months living on the compound um, and went back to Spokane and just started hanging out with skinheads and becoming involved with the skinhead scene. Uh, joined the military at 17, um, got discharged for being a skinhead and kind of being unrepentant about my beliefs. Uh, shortly after my discharge, I uh, went on a countrywide hate crime spree. Um, did hate crimes all the way from Las Vegas to Little Rock to Oklahoma City, and um, including the firebombing of a Jewish temple in, in Oklahoma City. And um, I was caught about a week, two weeks later, um, because of an FBI informant. Um, and I was sentenced to 39 years in federal prison. And uh, it's not a place that's, that's pleasant. I mean, my... Uh, during my sentencing, the rabbi said that he wanted me kept away from white supremacists because they would applaud my crime. And they immediately put me at USP Florence in Colorado, where I'm hanging out with David Lane. And um, they gave me a stack of white power literature. And there was, I would, I'd been prospecting for the Hammerskins at, at the time of my offense. And so um, I get there and there's three other Hammerskins. And uh, there's no consequences for violent behavior in federal prison as of that time period. I think it, the, the, the system's kind of changed. It's geared more towards rehabilitation now. It still has a, a long way. But um, back then it was just, hey, do what you want. And um, after several violent stabbings and incidents, because I just didn't care, um, I ended up going to the federal supermax in Colorado. And that's where I began to reevaluate my life. Um, you know, it's kind of hard from hard to hide from yourself when you're locked down for eight and a half years in solitary confinement straight at the nation's, you know, the Alcatraz of the Rockies, you know, the nation's most maximum security prison. And I just began to read and educate myself. And I was I was looking at myself after reading some of these psychology books and realizing like, man, my abuse has affected my relationships with the way I've interacted with people. And I just began to look at the world differently. And I started to look at my own behavior. I'm like, hey, here I am, always being the tip of the spear. Here I am, firebombing the synagogue. Nobody shows up. So all these comrades that I have, none of them showed up on my sentencing. These people don't care about me. They care about their own means. And, and I'd seen this with other people. And I just kind of 
brush it off. Like when, when a member of Aryan nations would commit a crime, Pastor Butler would try to like separate himself. But um, I just kind of was like realizing, you know, I, I, I stabbed a child molester 29 times. That's what got me to the Supermax. And the guy happened to also be a shark. And so he had a tattoo. And that's what brought me <laughs> to my attention the first time. And I'm, I'm sitting here in the hole getting ready to go to Supermax. And an anti-racist punk rocker with an anti-swastika tattoo came on the yard. And I sent word to one of the Hammerskins I knew. And I'm like, because by this time, actually, it was, it was kind of weird because David Lane wrote the Hammerskin Nation and got me a full patch after I was in prison, which was like really weird because it's like we're not a prison gang. But it was it was kind of crazy to have, mis- you know, we referred to him as Mr. Lane back then with reverence. Um, now I just call him David Lane, you know, he's he's. But we. Uh, I wrote a letter and I said, hey, are you guys going to take care of this? And they were out there too busy doing heroin and drugs. And I was like, I was like, man, everything we're supposed to be against all these skinheads are for, you know, like I got, I got a lot of flack because the first person I stabbed was a, a coyote bringing illegal immigrants over. And they were like, you can't stab him. He's a good white guy on the, you know, he's a peckerwood. And, and I'm just like, like, I thought we were skinheads, you know, and I just began to question it. And then by the time I got to the supermax, it was like, man, I had all these thoughts and I'm just like, wow, um, what have I done with my life? And I began to read, um, one of the first books I read that really kind of made me question race was Nelson Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom. Uh, when I read that, I was just like, I was blown away. I was like, holy shit, I got 40 years. Like, you know, so it's like, I'm never getting out of prison either, just like him. And, you know, and it's just, it was just amazing to to have so much similarity between me and him. And, and I liked fighting. He liked fighting. You know, he was a boxer. And I didn't think I was getting out. And I reached out. To a few organizations that were anti-racist organizations i wrote a couple organizations i wrote the nsm i was um in contact with uh cynthia smith and um of nsm and um you know i wrote them in, two, in 2008 2009 and said i'm done with the movement and never heard anything back began reaching out um one of the people who actually reached out to me and i'm still friends with to this day is daryl jenkins from one people's project Daryl Lamont Jenkins is, uh, he's good people. And um, uh, me and him had had our issues because when I was a member of Aryan Nations, I sent him a picture of me with the AK-47 and said, come, here's my address. You know, I'm not afraid of any of you. And and uh, this is the first guy that really wanted to forgive me. And we, we corresponded for quite some time and I got a lot of flack. I mean, even these prison gangs like Aryan Brotherhood of, um, you know, they're not really racial. They're more prison racial. I think there's a difference because they're more about um, drugs and protection while they're in prison. And the Aryan Brotherhood, actually, their top three guys were Jewish. So <laughs> it's actually kind of surprising, you know, but um, a lot of black for these supposedly racial gangs that I'm a race trader. I got called everything from race trader to, excuse my words, nigger lover. They they there was active death threats on me and, and um you know i ended up spending my last the, the laws started changing um the courts because of a ruling in a case called johnson and then later on an immigration case demaya and led into davis which was the criminal statute they invalidated my count one so i was able to spend the last three years just studying in the law library and um it was right after a really low point. You know, I, I had 40 years here. I am having to serve a 40 year sentence for a, a cause I no longer believe in that when I was arrested, I told the FBI, I mean, I have the 302s where it was like, I will spend the rest of my life for my beliefs. Um, when they, when they sentenced me to 39 years, I gave a Nazi salute in the courtroom. And, um, you know, I was very dedicated and having to live with that. I, and, being at the supermax after eight and a half years, I, I tried to end my life and it was just a bad point in my life. Um, the law started changing. I started spending time in the law library and started getting a lot of psycho- uh, psychological help from the, the prison psychologist to kind of identify where my head was. And um, in 2020, um, 
<laughs> I was actually found innocent on my count one. Um, the Supreme Court invalidated the the residual clause of Davis and uh, they took 30 years off. So I went from having a 40 year sentence to overnight, the guards just showed up and said, you have two hours to leave the prison. I had boots tattooed with red laces on my face. I had the, the you know, the African Hunter Corps, Blood and Honor triple sevens on my, on my chin. Um, skinhead on my knuckles with swastikas and SS bolts and you name it. And um, they were like, here's 75 bucks in a plane ticket. No help, no psychological preparation. Cause I went from like being an asshole. Like I was, I was an incorrigible prisoner. I never thought I was getting out. So I was extorting child molesters. Like, cause they put me on a, a game dropout yard that was like 85% sex offender. And it was so hard for me because I'm just like, Focus on your appeal. Focus on your appeal. Your family wants yeah. you to do thing. And the entire I, time. I, just, I wear her every single one of them. Sorry. That's you, you're gonna, you might have to edit that out. Sorry, Joe. I missed, I missed Larry Nasser by just a couple of weeks. And I probably would have screwed off my appeal for that. <laughs> I mean, I'm just, you know, <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, uh, I just didn't care. And finally, I was able to get a second chance. And I came out, second day I was out, I started working. Second day I was out. My brother had his own business and he got me on there and I was doing plaster work. And, you know, my family and me have had some tumultuous relationships. So at that point, we kind of split up for a little bit, me and my brother. We've, our, our relationship's still kind of tense. Um, just tried to figure out what I was going to do to my life. I, there was a really cool guy. When I got out, um, I haven't, I got my family crest back on the back of my head and a few tattoos I couldn't take care of because just can't afford it. But there was a really cool guy. He doesn't, he, he didn't get to finish all of my arms and stuff, but what was really cool is I get out and I'm looking for a tattoo removal. Cause I'm like, Hey, look, I, I need to get these tattoos off my face. And, uh, they had a guy here, uh, they called him laser Larry and he worked at a tattoo parlor here. And the guy was like, uh, I said, hey, I'm just kind of getting a, a price quote. And he says, uh, he says, well, just send me some pictures and I'll give you a quote. So I did. And he just hit me back and he's like, dude, he's like, I'm going to laser your stuff for free. And I was like, for real? And he's like, yeah. He's like, I said, like, why would you do that? And he's just, he's like, man, I was a homeless junkie that got out of prison and nobody gave a damn about me and nobody helped me. And he's like, I see you're really trying to change your life. So he's like, I'm going to do that for you. It was kind of cool. It was just like, all right, cool. And, you know, he got my facial tattoos gone at least, you know, and my neck and started baiting. I mean, I got my hands covered uh, after a while. Um, right now, I might actually have to laser him because I'm trying to push for a felony waiver, believe it or not, to get back in the army if I can. Um, wow. It's kind of hard. They have a, the Lautenberg Amendment. Like, they can waive my felonies, the recruiter said, but the Lautenberg Amendment makes it so I have to have my firearm rights restored before they can allow me in. And that's probably unlikely to happen. So I'm trying to deal with that issue legally, trying to see if I can get a senator to make an amendment that veterans get a, a waiver for that or something. Um, but since I've been out, I, I just didn't know what to do. So I was kind of back and forth between a few jobs because I didn't have any idea what I wanted to do in life. I went to went to prison at age 20, you know, and it's just uh, I was like, man, I'm I'm too old to be a journeyman for a lot of these things because it's just tearing my body up. And, you know, I had a hard time in prison. I mean, I've been beat by guards with batons and, you know, I just have, I've, been, I've had a hard, it was, it was, and I do MMA. I mean, I got out, um, you know, I was old. I was 30, 36 when I got out, but I was 37 when I fought. And I was just like, Hey, you know what? I've always wanted to fight and I had plans on it. And uh, I got out and just destroyed two people in my first two fights and um including a 20 year old kid which felt kind of good i was like that's the guy still got it right <laughs> but, but um and i'm friends with every single one of them my first opponent actually was a hispanic gentleman named santos perez and to this day we keep in contact he's a great kid um got a good head on his shoulders and he's just a good person and his family as well um and uh my gym has just been amazing because Coming from my background, it was about the first month I was out, I went to the gym and I still had all my tattoos. 
And they look to be kind of crooked because we have Terrence McKinney, an African-American UFC fighter who's on a tear right now. He uh, He's my teammate. So it's like, you know, we had a very diverse gym. Um, and they took me in. And as they've got to know me, they become family. I mean, like, I would do anything for those people. And my coach, Pablo Alfonso, is a Cuban-American. And his wife is a white lady. And these are people that, 20 years ago, I would have had nothing to do with, you know, and now that's like, that's like my surrogate father, you know? Um, And so I've kind of developed since, since I've been there, I kind of transitioned. I I got lucky. I got hired on a women's domestic violence shelter. Um, I was kind of surprised they hired me being a felon, Um, but they're very open towards people changing their life and, and having lived experience and, um, I, th- I like to think I've done a good job. I've been there almost a year now. Um, I enjoy it. I've helped a lot of people. It's been a, a different career path than I, than I would have thought. And at times can be emotionally taxing to see some of the, the way, you know, when you see a woman come up and she's been just beaten to where she looks like the elephant man and you see women who are being raped, it's, it's not a, not pleasant um but i like to think i can give some type of comfort to them um and help them adjust their lives as they need it uh, so that's basically where i'm at now um yeah. oh, that's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's incredible sean I, you just you just like knocked out uh, uh most of the questions i had for you but <laughs> holy cow uh, it, it's just incredible uh, your your entire story and then what what took place um, and I just was going to ask you what year or not what year but how old were you when you rode your bike out to Aryan Nations do you remember 15 years old 17 15 15 and what year was that uh 1999 yeah I was at the, I, right. I made it. that was I'm much older than you <laughs> I'm wondering because I I hung out and stuff with um a guy named Sean and a guy named Sam. Sean is, it was me, Sean, uh, Sean was from Montana, right? One of the Montana front working class. No, I think he was from Spokane. My wife knows, like, my wife actually was a skinhead as well. Um, we actually married before I went to prison, but she too has left the movement. And um, she, she just yelled his name. She's like, Sean. <laughs> so, um, yeah. You know, that's that's their aspect. When I got out, um, that was very helpful. I, I forgot to add as well. Um, I got lucky because, you know, I didn't expect the last conversation I had with my wife was not a good one. I was at the Supermax. Um, she she was dating and marrying, remarrying a skinhead that after she left me while I was in prison that I introduced her to. And uh, I got told I was a Navy lover and a race trader. And it was a very hard conversation. Later on, she left the movement and I didn't know that. And I got out and I called her about, oh man, I want to say about a week, week or so after I got out. And I said, uh, I found her on Facebook. I was like, what's Facebook? You know, (laughs) it was all new to me. And, um, you know, now we got TikTok and everybody. It's, uh, I was like, hey, um, like, do you have any of my stuff? And we fell back in love again and we've been together ever since. And, you know, they were on the rocks and, um you know he was still he was a golden state skinhead so um you know that she was ready to get away from all that stuff as well and and uh, we've created a life together and i mean i've already it, it's a crappy 1968 double wide but i've completely redone it with laminate floors and one of the bronze fixtures so i got a house and we're about to sell it and i mean i owe like 11 grand on it we're about to make like a, an extremely good profit on it almost 100 grand profit and uh gonna get me into some land and, and with the house you know so and then i'll just keep moving up as i need to as i because i can do the construction work myself so that's um, an amazing amazing awesome. success story uh, it's just incredible especially after all those years sean and in, in prison so many people reoffend or or they just they they lose hope and they and they go back or or they stumble and uh you know just seeing what you've been able to accomplish and and uh and you and your wife together and and just uh moving forward it's just it's just so incredible and inspiring and and that's why it's such an honor to have you on and 
And um, I'm just thinking back to the to the 90s. I first met you at Aryan Nation. So were you, this is where I was going with the question. You were only 17 when we met or, or around that age or what? I was somewhere around there. Yeah. Because um, wow. I remember you, I mean, that was, I was when I think Rick was, Rick Montbaron was the staff leader at the time because Sean was like the national youth leader at the time. And oh. um, he still act. I, I tried to call, when I got out, I tried to call Sean out on a, on an MMA fight. He outweighs me about a hundred pounds, but I, I think I used to beat up on him. So I think I could take him, but I was like, I was like, Hey, you know, I was like, if you wanted to, I could set it up in the cage. Cause you ruined a lot of my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> he didn't want to do it. But he never, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a, uh, it was a different time. And, you know, uh, I still have mixed feelings because I have, <clears throat> like I was filming the documentary we did for Paramount Plus and um and I got to go to the old compound and it was really weird because I have like mixed feelings because it's like so much of our life has been destroyed by what I learned up there and, and they, but I had a lot of great experiences up there I mean it's 25 acres to play in when you're a kid you know and and it's just like it's really hard and it's like even Pastor Butler it's like he's he was always nice to me you know, and that's the, that's the, and he's, he's done a lot of evil stuff, but he's like, he was really nice to me. So it's kind of hard to, and to see that duality of like mankind of like how we can be so terrible, but do so many good things. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's just kind of weird. It's kind of like Hitler. It's like, he did so many bad things, but if you see his interaction with like his dogs, it's like, here's like a guy who's a human being it's like how is this evil person a human being and it's it's hard for people to really kind of like wrap their heads around that i've i've seen you know and there's a lot of a lot of psychology to unpack there i mean that's i think that's a lifelong learning learning type of type of thing and and uh i was going to ask you too and and i don't want to keep uh hammering on this issue but the i i just imagine I can't, I can't imagine even just being all those years in, in prison and having that, that uh, amount of time. And I guess my question on that is, is that feeling of hopelessness, like, you know, and, and, and that you were able to do that change in prison, surrounded in, in that environment that you explained, um, yeah. how difficult, like, my gosh, like, uh, for us, our, our, uh, our process, we were on the outside. I can't, I just can't imagine how difficult that must have been in prison. If you can unpack any of that to share with the, the audience, some of that feeling of hopelessness and how that changed and, and where, um, I know you explained a little bit earlier on it. Um, but, uh, gosh, I mean, it just, it just seems like there's, there's, there's so much more there. There is, I mean, it wasn't overnight, you know, a lot of it, um, having like the, the solitary confinement at the ADX, it was, it had like, it was like a double-edged sword. Cause like, it was very hard to deal with being alone. Like I used to actually like, cause you, you know, we're human beings. We like to be touched. We like, even if it's just a, a, a you know, a little bro hug or, or a handshake and I didn't have that. So like, there was times when I literally would destroy myself just so the sort team could come in and do a cell extraction and beat me up because I needed to feel some type of human contact. And one good thing so you had that negative aspect of it and then the other good thing is I was able to have an incredible amount of time to study like I read just like if I if we would had college courses I would have a PhD while I was there I mean I and um I just I watched a, a lot of film was actually very helpful um because like I I watched over 3,700 movies when I was in there. And a lot of them were ones that I would not have watched originally. Um, I became a big uh, Sidney Poitier fan. And there's a, there's a movie he has called The Patch of Blue that deals directly with racism. And it's a blind white girl who, who becomes a friend and kind of maybe falls in love. They don't really like push that too far because it is a 1960s movie. But they kind of do. And... Shelly Winters is the racist mother and it's just being able to see hey man you know like if we didn't have sight like how would we look at people around us and then I just watched an incredible amount of movies and it was very helpful and, and along with reading um 
and you know it just it, it was not easy it wasn't overnight because a lot of it had become so ingrained that i had to force myself to watch um interracial couples or um homosexual couples and stuff on tv i would just watch those shows so I was like, you know what? This isn't as bad as I'm making it out to be in my head. And the movement is made out to be. They're not affecting my life. Why can't they live their life how they want to live it? And, you know, I'm not perfect. I, I know it may seem like I just done everything right. But I, st- I struggle all the time. Um, you know, there are times that um, my relationship with my wife is rocky. And we go to couples counseling to fix that. Just because it's not we're not i mean there's just there's a lot of of damage that's been done by prison and and stuff like that and how i interact with people and i and i've come a long way but i still have a long way to go i don't think anybody's done journeying to change themselves um i you know try to do my best to to make every day better um and it's, it, it's, I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain. It's, it's, uh, it was a long time. And, um, I mean, out of the, I was in for 16 years and two months. And out of that time, I spent probably 13 plus in the hole or in, um, solitary confinement by myself, probably the majority of it in solitary. Um, and that's hard to deal with. I mean, you know, there's times when I just want to be left alone, you know, and it's, and it's not that I'm antisocial because I'm a very sociable person. Like, you know, I mean, um, but the person I, I was then is not who I am now. I mean, one of my coworkers is a self-identified non-binary communist. <laughs> and they are <laughs> the coolest person. Like, we don't agree on much, but like, we do karaoke. Like, I, you know, and it's like, you know, um, we go out and her partner or their partner and my wife <laughs> we all hang out and do karaoke and I don't agree with her because I'm still conservative you know um but or them but I and I'm still working on the pronouns because that's something that's changed since I got out of prison and as part of my work we deal with non-binary trans people at the shelter so um it's something I still work on but like we had we care about who we who each other are as people not our political beliefs and i don't think there's much of that discourse in america now because it's either you're a democrat or republican like even my family you know it's like my family's trump supporters and then i have one liberal democrat and and they hate hate each other over their political beliefs and it's like what happened to just being family you know and and caring about each other it's like you can't even come together one or two holidays a year to just put that aside and just love each other you know and that's <laughs> that's something that was hard for me coming out um in 2020 was just the political culture is different um there's a lot more sensitivity in the current generation than there was in my generation even amongst the homeless you know it's like you know when i was homeless it was like shut up you know <laughs> deal with it and it's like now it's like oh we need therapy and it's like what like like dude like <laughs> okay <laughs> you know um, and it's probably a combination of the two is, is probably a good thing, you know, you know, but uh, I don't know. It's just been an interesting journey. So Jen, did you have any questions? I'm just, I'm not easily, I'm really honestly not easily impressed. And your story is amazing. I'm really glad you brought him on, Jeff. So I, I would assume that when, what year did you go into prison? I went in in 2004. 2004 to 2000 to 2020. That, that there was, think about how much difference and just in, like he said, the political environment, everything, it just in society in general within that time. Were you worried when you were coming out that anyone would recognize you? No, not, not anything about that. Like, you know, I think most of the movement's about talk. I mean, I don't think they're ever, like, I don't think I've ever felt any fear of my life for leaving the movement, especially now. It's like talking to Daryl from One People's Project, it seems like <laughs> the movement's different. I mean, the fact that there's people who are like openly gay and some of the all rights, I'm just kind of like, 
like you're in the movement like no that's kind of different um and i just i i just don't want to live my life like constantly in fear and i don't think that i i know when i got out um still having racial tattoos i was very because like we've been you know we were in prison able to watch the news and i'm like oh george floyd there's riots like there's people going to come up and start stuff with me and Honestly, when I got out, I've only had one person, one person that has like questioned me when I still had my tattoos. And it was actually, it was a, it was a white lady with dreadlocks who was (laughs) at a KOA and her her husband owned the KOA. And I came in and I was going there. I was having a family thing with my brother for, I think it was 4th of July. And we we went in and, and I was checking out at the stand getting some supplies and she's like that's a pretty bold statement she looked at the swastika on my hand and I was and I'm like oh like finally somebody and it took about a year so I was kind of like finally somebody's asking me something honest and I explained my life and I explained my change and it got to the point where she wanted to invite me to dinner with her husband and so it's like being able to have that dialogue and she's like that is amazing that you've changed and like (coughs) um you know, it, it's just, it, it's, it's pretty, I kind of liked it because it gave me the end, the opportunity to explain myself. Um, because I, I mean, I had got looks, but nobody was ever bold enough to say anything. And it kind of yeah. made me, it's like, I can see you looking, I can see you're upset. Just give me a question, you know, like treat me like a human being. Don't look at me right. like, uh, you know, and, and uh, because that's not what we do in prison. It's like, you got to, problem with someone like what's what's going on you got a problem you know it's like it's it's a different environment it's like oh you do okay we'll just go in the cell and we'll deal with it you know and you're gonna talk about it you're gonna fight about it and so <clears throat> having the this like society I, I expected more pushback but honestly people people have been very open including people that I disagree with because like I don't agree with everything the Black Lives Matter movement does it doesn't mean I don't care about black lives but it's right. just I with some of the political leaders and stuff and what I see as the vision in America, but that's my belief. I have my coworkers that I would take a bullet for and a lot of them are on the total, like I'm probably the only conservative at my work. I mean, I, and I work with a bunch of really cool women um, and now another man um, at the, at the shelter and you know, it's just, I treat them just like I would everyone else. So, um, you know, they're good people. Life sure is different than, than, uh, than before too, you know, not being able to see that humanity in others. And that's, that's what I'm hearing from, from the story is that having that dialogue and, and just, just that what you shared with us about the lady at the KOA, look at the dialogue and, and how that, like you were waiting for that, waiting for someone to, to say something. And then it turned into this wonderful conversation and, and uh, you know, it opened up uh, hearts and minds and we do need more of that in this country. And, and that's, that's one takeaway, I think from uh, you know, anybody that's listening to, to really take to heart and, and have those conversations. And, and just as Sean said, we don't have to agree on everything. I mean, that's, that's the problem in the country right now is that people won't talk. They won't have those conversations and, and, uh, I tell you, you know, someone coming from the background that you came out of and, and all the, the trauma, Sean, and, and everything you went through for you to be able to come through like that and, and, uh, and be this success story and be so honest about it and everything. It's just, it's incredible. And, and uh, I really hope a lot of people uh, take that to heart and, and listen. Well, and if you just propose that reaction to 20 years ago, um, if somebody had commented on my tattoos or, um, my flight jacket or laces, just the way the reaction was different. And I know I've seen you talk about it on one of your um, podcasts of, you know, punching somebody's not going to get them to change their mind. And yeah. it's like 20 years ago, I would have been like, you got a problem with it, you know, and I would have said something to them. And just having that interaction where I could, I had like a crossroads there, I could have been very defensive and caused more issues but actually explaining myself brought it to open dialogue that led to a good you know and and not every dialogue is going to be 
a good outcome. I mean, let's, let's be honest, you know, you're going to have people who just don't accept change. Like I've had pushback, like I said, at, at some of the, the local universities of students that don't want me there, you know, I mean, the, um, the students fell unsafe and the, I don't understand it because I'm talking about the same stuff that you agree with, but um, not having that dialogue is the same as just letting that stuff continue. And I think you have to work together, like, you know, and I just, hopefully there's opportunities here at some of these universities in the future where they're more open to change. Um, I spoke at the Human Rights Education Institute in, in Hayden Lake, uh, or in Coeur d'Alene rather, um, back in March or April, and we had a really good uh, interaction in the community, including several people that were uh, victims of hate crimes from Aryan nations, an LGBT couple, uh, there was a lesbian couple, and they were very leery about me. And at the end, we gave each other hugs, um, you know, and they were victims of, of hate crimes by Aryan nation members. Um, they actually, and then they had someone who had their, their mailbox blown up by Aryan nations members as well. There was some of these people that I'd heard about when I was in the movement. And um, it was kind of interesting being on the other side of the fence because before I would have been out there with Sean Winkler and Mike Teague and we would have been holding up signs. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting too, like when I reached out to people, because I was kind of curious because I'm like, man, I wonder how many people are still in the movement. And I've seen so many people have left. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, you know, Mike T and Christian T, his wife, are both no longer in the movement. Um, in fact, ironically, they have a mixed grandchild. So, <laughs> you know, and they love that grandchild. So, you know, it's kind of uh, interesting because 20 years ago, that was not the, the people I remember. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting seeing how many people have just left the movement and openly left the movement. And the ones that are still there, uh, like Sean Winkler, just doesn't surprise me because unfortunately, like, I don't think he has more than the movement, you know? Um, and I think there's probably some psychological reasons for that, having interacted with him for so many years that he's dependent. It gives him a, a status that he can't find with anything else, unfortunately. And, and as much as I have a personal beef, I would love to help them leave the movement because you know, I, I, I hate to see somebody wasting so much of their life. And, and it's kind of amazing. Like me and my wife have talked about it where how much time we used to just focus on hating other people. Like mm -hmm. get off work. Now I can just play my PlayStation 5, enjoy life, have, have a cuddle with my wife instead of being, hey, we're going we're gonna to print out literature and go, go on a literature run tonight. And we're going to do this and that. And, um, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's funny one well it's not funny because it was one of my one of my friends uh, i just found out past um she was a skinhead but she wasn't she was more into it for the music i don't think she was like like a gentle believer um she was more like an ex-punk that just kind of got into it fell into the scene um and she had left it and before she had passed i just found out a couple weeks ago that she passed um we had been at a party and people were drinking and, and um, they had some, some other ones that were using and I'm was going off on it. I was like, you guys are race traders. We're in this cause. Why aren't we taking this money instead of spending it on booze to go get some CDs and literature and pass it out of schools. And she, she told me, she was like, is that all you think about is hate? And I'm just like, this is skin it telling me that. And it goes back to just being, just wanting to, my own need to be the most extreme person, you know? And I think that's what led to my crime. Because you got, I mean, you, you've been in the movement. People talk about doing stuff, but not too many people actually do stuff. And then I've had a crazy amount of conversations with David Lane when I was in federal prison about that. Same thing. You know, um, I, I sent you guys a picture of me and David Lane. That was just one of me. Um, and that's what I focused on. And having that time to where I'm not focused on that, it's like, it's so much less stress on me. Like, I don't even watch the news. Like, occasionally something will come across my Facebook feed that, 
interests me or maybe like affects me locally, you know, like, uh, you know, serial killer stalking women or something. I'm like, holy shit, I'm hoping it's not one of my girls at work or something, you know, at the shelter. Um, other than that, I don't care. Like, you know, I don't care about the news, you know, and I try to stay away from it. And that's probably the best advice my dad's given me. <laughs> you know? Like, he, he stopped watching it. And, you know, I mean, there are certain things that may come up that I, that I but other than that, I don't, I just focus on my life. You know? Do you think now, looking back and, and uh, pa- unpacking the, getting involved in it is it, do you think that it was uh for a lot of people it's like searching for this sense of belonging and and uh community and things like that and and uh um and especially with the trauma that you had uh, growing up do you think that that played a a big part in your trajectory into the movement yeah absolutely like as a white kid i didn't fit in with the black and hispanic gangs you know like had i I had like the Sereños or somebody came up and been like, Hey, what's up, Weto? You know, come, come with us. Who knows? I might've had a different trajectory in life. Um, but I didn't fit in with them because they, they were the kids that when I was in juvenile detention and group homes, they were the, the ones that bullied me. So I'm like, Hey, like, why would I fit in with you? Like I'm white. You know, it's not that I uh, was raised in a hateful environment. I was not raised racial at all. Like my, my dad was <laughs> very adamant against racism um i have a very diverse family i have a cousin who's a doctor from mexico um i have a cousin that's half native american i have an aunt that's japanese by marriage and i have a cousin who's gay and um to have such a diverse family and be the only nazi it's like you know it's kind of weird because even to this day my family doesn't invite me to family gatherings you know, um, and that's something that still hurts because it's like, hey, I've changed and I've paid my debt to society and I've never directly hurt you. Why can't you accept me for the change I am? And it's something I, I struggle with, you know. Um, I've ruined a lot of my family relationships and, you know, it's like Christmas, I'm working and I've tried to, and my, my wife's going to be volunteering at the shelter. So instead of going to family, we're, we're going to feed some homeless women who are dealing with their own stuff and you know try to give them a good christmas and i i, I kind of enjoy that a lot more like i don't have kids um we're, we're working on it <laughs> we're both kind of old so it's kind of you know there's there's the difficulties of her being 42 um but we're we're working on it because we want to give a, a, a kid a good life you know we want to we want the kid to be raised better than we were but I enjoy, I have some, some good friends from the gym and stuff. And, um, I enjoy giving, you know, I bought a bunch of presents already and it's like, I, you know, I could be selfish and spend all the money on myself, but I, I'm really enjoying giving some of these guys. Cause like one of my best friends, Bryce is a great father, great man, hard worker, but he got laid off because the company couldn't afford to keep him in this economy. And, uh, you know, he's like, I couldn't afford Christmas. So I went out and bought him some presents and I'm not putting my name on it. I'm not putting Santa, I'm putting Bryce and I'm putting from dad because I want his kids to know that he loves them and he's a good dad and he is a great dad. So like, it feels kind of good to do that because I'm like, I'm all excited right now. I'm like, yay. <laughs> so, but I, I enjoy, uh, this weird, I mean, it's, it's just weird. Like there's times I find myself, um, you know, camping and stuff like that. And it's just, it's like, really? Like, <laughs> I can go camping in North Idaho right now. It's one of the most beautiful woods in the world. And it's just like, it's amazing, you know, just going up there to, and it's, and it's weird because these are the same places I went with their nations up to Hayden Creek. But it's like, I go up there with a different mentality and I have a lot more fun. You know, I'm not up there to fire rifles or for, you know, I'm a felon anyway, but I'm not up there to fire rifles and train for the, for Rahoa or something like that you know I'm I'm training for hey I just want to go up and have fun and have a couple of beers and you know see if we can put our feet in the creek you know it's like it's just enjoy life and uh you know so life is life is so much better yeah. without without that heavy baggage of of hate and and uh, racism and and just that polar polarizing uh, mentality isn't it yeah yeah it's like even if like if I had fought 20 years ago 
like doing the MMA, it's like I would have missed out on some good friends. I mean, first of all, the you know <laughs> the, the first kid I fought wasn't even born. I think still old, but <laughs> you know, but say I had fought a Hispanic fighter twenty years ago, like I wouldn't have you know, it's like, it's, it's even, it's on YouTube. Like when I, when I beat it and I dominated him and he's a good kid. And uh, I think he's evolved as a fighter um, since our fight. But it's like, first thing I did was get up and give him a hug. And, you know, after I got off on top of him, it was just like, I hit, thank you. You know, you gave me a fight. You gave me what, and, you know, unfortunately I got a little bit of addicted to fighting. I wanted one, you know, I was like, Oh, just one. And then it's like, you know, I didn't want more. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of on a losing streak right now, but my, my last two fights, uh, I cut 23 pounds in two days to fight for a title, um, on short notice, hadn't been to the gym, just got over COVID and my brother had died. So it was like, I just needed to get some, some, some emotions out and the weight cut did not. Yeah. I, I think I could have done a lot better. I just, I got in there and I felt like a 12 year old holding a grown man. I was like, usually I. I like to wrestle because that's my favorite. So it's like, usually I'll just pick someone up and dump them. And uh, I got to hold them. It was like, no, nope, I don't have the strength. I lost 23 pounds in two days. <laughs> and then the other one I took on an eight hour notice fight was winning the fight and got caught in an arm bar and had my arm popped out. So um, in an arm bar, but uh, I think me and him are going to fight again. He's and, and both of them are my great friends now, you know? So um it's kind of interesting because like, you know, this last Friday I got or Saturday, a couple days ago, I got to, to go to the fights and I saw the dude I fought and we haven't seen each other for a while. And, you know, we were talking about the arm bar and he's like, dude, I was so scared because you hit hard. I see you fight. And I was like, I didn't want to get hit. And the arm bar was there. And it's like, just, it, it's, it's a, it's a family, just not, not even, and this guy doesn't even go to my gym, but it's like everybody I've competed with, they're really all about making people better and that's one that's why i like mma and i know some people may find that in rock climbing or whatever you know whatever your hobby may be but mine just happens to be mma and and i'm getting to the point where my body's telling me stop you're old <laughs> you know but uh i'm starting to transition to to keeping with that community but i've done ringside commentating for the last uh about, about the last year almost um i've missed a couple of cards but because of work and stuff but um i'm starting to enjoy that as well because it's the same thing and i'm still going to be part of it and, you know i'm knowledgeable I'm, I'm, i think i'm actually better as an announcer than i am as a fighter so because i know the techniques but i know sometimes it's hard when that adrenaline's going to remember everything so, <laughs> so. that's awesome well hey uh, thank you so much jen unless you have any final questions um i or sean if, if there's anything else uh you you, you want to talk about uh I did want to say something about like my views um, real quick. Cause I think it's kind of important. Um, no, no, don't, don't, don't rush. Uh, you got all the time, all the time you want, Sean. There was a time when I first got out and this goes to having a, a good woman that I love. Um, when I got out, I, I wasn't, this is, I want to say it was like two or three months after I'd been out I already had a really nice badass Mustang. Like I was doing well. And, uh, I kind of gave up for a minute. So it's like, everybody thinks life's perfect. And, you know, it took me 15 minutes, even though there's a police report from when I was a kid to find the guy who abused me. And I was still struggling when I got out. And having such a good woman stopped me from making a mistake. And I think like this is important for like a few survivors is I drove all the way to the guy's house and I had a baseball bat. I had every intention of just going after the dude. And two things stopped me. A, the guy who abused me had his children outside on the front yard. And I was like, I'm not going to traumatize those kids. And B, one thing that's really stuck by me in having such a great woman is Brandy was on Bluetooth and was on, on my car telling me, stop, turn around. He's already taken so much of your life. He's going to take you. And those words really kind of broke through the anger I had. Because I was just on that, like, well, you know, I got to, you know, take care of this. And 
like I said, it was just a couple months out of prison. So I still had that 39 year mentality where I'm just like, whatever, mm-hmm. dude, you know? And it's like, um, being able to, to have such a woman that is, can tell me something I don't want to hear, but being able to listen to that because I love her has made it, she's the reason I've been successful, not me. I mean, you know, having somebody, you know, they say behind every, every, every man is an even stronger woman. And I think that's so true, (laughs) you know, so having Brandy with me and, and the love she gives me, it, it makes it worth it. So. Wow, brother, man. Thank, thanks for sharing that. That's, that's just, that's, it's heartbreaking and, and inspiring all at the same time because I, it's, it's hard. I, and yeah. 500. I mean, for, for here, that's a very expensive house, 570 K in a gated community and on a lake and he's a pharmacist and he goes to Venice and it was hard. Cause it's like, I thought, I thought about the times when I've been assaulted by guards because I've assaulted a guard and they had me four pointed to a bed at the supermax for more than 24 hours and beat me with batons. And I'm just thinking like, wow, he was in Venice while I was doing that. And it just, it sometimes it's hard, but I'm like, you know what? My freedom's more important. So yeah, no, I just, uh, you know, and then it, as I'm doing this, I just got a text from one of my coworkers said, you're a good guy hanging in there. Cause they know, We've had a last, the last couple of days have been really hard. So as it just popped up on the screen, so, you know, that's the, that's the, I got, I got good people around me. I think that's, I think that's what's important because, you know, I have a, I have a friend of mine that got out of prison and he actually moved to Coeur d'Alene and started hanging out with it, with Harry Nations. And he went to prison for a hate crime after he got out. And, uh, you know, he's, he's the guy who held the, the child molester for me when I stabbed him in prison. And he's, hey, you want to hang out? And I said, no. You know, it's like, he's a good guy. He's no longer racial, but he cannot stay out of prison. And I think you have a choice to make. You want to hang out with people that are going to set you back, or are you going to hang out with people who are going to bring you back to places you don't want to be? And I don't. And, you know, he respected that. I told him, I was like, hey, man, you know, I was like, I don't mind being your Facebook friend. Like, you know, I'm not just shining you off. I was like, you know, I'll definitely help you if I could find you a job or something. You want to try to get your life on trajectory and you show me a pattern, then I'm fine hanging out with you. But for now, I'm I'm fine. You got to make a decision in life. Are your kids important or prison? So I think that's the most important thing is getting it in your head that you're going to make it. Because there's, I mean, I'm not saying I won't ever go back to prison because I, I did tell the prison counselors, I said, if someone touches my kid, like I will do what I got to do and accept the consequences of it. Like I, I'm, and I, that's the only reason I'm coming back to prison. You know, someone says my niece or nephews or something, but I was like, you know what, there's consequences and I'm willing to accept those consequences and I'll stand up in court and own them like a man. But I'm hoping and praying that does not happen because I just want to focus on me and doing my life, you know? So Thank you so much for for being on the on the show, Sean, and and sharing everything with with uh, the audience. And and you're 100 a good guy, man. I, that 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 was nice to hear about that text. That's a uh, good support network around you. And and uh, it's it's so amazing uh, to see you again after so many years, and and that you're out and doing so well. It's just it's freaking incredible, man. It's just awesome. Thank you again. Yeah, no problem. Thank you.